I'm going to give you some notes at the beginning. I'm, I'm not in any hurry to get through this. I would rather you get it than get through it. I think that's important. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to open the scriptures to Genesis 1. You can never have enough Genesis 1 and 2 in your life. I promise you this. And here's what we're dealing with. This series is called The Church, and you're saying, well, we haven't really gotten to the church yet. If you do any study on something and you go directly to it, you're in trouble. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible has a lot to say around it to prepare you for it. We believe that the Scriptures are the progressive revelation of God. When you start in Genesis 1... You know only what Genesis 1 tells you about God. But as you progress through, you learn more about God, any particular doctrine, any particular understanding, regardless of what it is. God's Word is telling you the truth from beginning to end. And it moves forward just like any other book from beginning to end. Progressive revelation. This is important. So to understand the church, the church doesn't even come into play in the Bible officially until Acts chapter 2. And so if that is the case, well, we got a whole lot of books before that that are prepping our minds for understanding where the church fits. Now, some people deny this, and that's okay. We love them anyway because they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. But God has divinely revealed himself to mankind in various ways over history. And God has a plan for the ages. How many of you would feel really good if God didn't have a plan about here forward? Does that sound like a good time? No, you might start to believe that CNN's telling you the truth. That would be scary. There really is somebody that's going to bomb us. Our culture is bred on fear. This book is built on hope. It's a grand difference. See, when we talk about things being the the sin, the flesh, and the devil, you know, don't be lovers of the world. One of the ways that we fall into loving the world is denying this. Simply denying what it says. It is God's word. It is true. And it is the only source of truth in existence, period. That's it. That's it and that's all. So for us to look anywhere else and to buy into anything else, is ultimately saying what this says is not true. It's not a fence issue. Remember, you sit on the fence, you start to hurt. You got to be on one side or the other. There is no fence sitting. So in order for us to understand where the church falls and why the responsibility we have and why where we are in history is so significant, why church attendance and church membership is not a nominal thing, it's not. We often think it is, That's what the world has told us. That's not how Christ has structured the church. So if that is the case, by the way, he's from Kentucky. That's why he's saying amen. (laughs) He's a preacher. He's from Kentucky. And that's how we do it down there. So not only are we going to be learning this, I want you to learn from him as well. Okay? There you go. See? See? Amen. There you go. Yeah, you do it again, Mitch. Do it again. There we go. I love it. It's amazing. You're all going to be graded at the end of this. It's good. Now, before we jump into Genesis 1, I want you to have your Bibles ready. But what we need to understand is the word dispensation. The word dispensation. And I've got it up here for for you in the in the PowerPoint slide, just so you remember it. We had it down for a little while. You may already have it in your notes. You don't need to copy it again. If not, I want you to look at it. It's the Greek word oikonomia. It's where we get the English word economy from. And it's the idea of a structured existence that is managed or stewarded in some way. The word oiko means house. The word nomia or namas means law. It is God's house. Law. And Ryrie gives us a definition here. The central idea in the word dispensation is that of managing or administering the affairs of a household. Or let me say it this way God is in control of history, and by being in control of history, He is not just haphazardly coming upon the years. He has a plan, He will execute that plan. And he wants his kids to know about his plan. 
The wiser we are about his plan, the better we will interpret the scriptures, the better we will understand our significance in this time in history, and a lot less worries we're going to have about what's to come next. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good dose of medicine, and one that I probably need to be having two or three times a day. So the idea is God's house law, how he is administering his affairs upon the earth. Now, I don't know that my notes, if you notice, I actually have, I I hate using notes. I actually have two pages of notes here, okay? What we're going to get through, I don't know, but we will, okay? So what's the next slide, Mitch? Forgive me for not remembering. Ah, there are four phases to every dispensation. There are four things that happen. Now, if you've got your chart in front of you, you will notice that I've broken it up for you into those types of divisions. So you don't necessarily need to write this down unless you want to. But I encourage you, pay attention to the chart, use your sermon booklet, write these things down if you like. And again, if you miss any of this, you can go to gbcportage.com, go to sermons, go to where Mitch posts it. By the way, again, Mitch does a phenomenal job with all of our audio and all that stuff. And he actually documents the slides on there for you that you can filter through and look at each one. Number one, God issues a requirement of mankind. Now, this is why I don't buy into this fatalistic, God has, has a, only predestined some people to go to heaven and that type of thing. I don't buy into that. Why is that? Because his obligation is to the whole world. And if he is pulling the strings, everybody learn, if he is pulling the strings on everybody and you can only do what he controls you to do, which for some people they go as far as blaspheming God and to say that he's responsible for sin as well, that's heretical. But if that's the case, you can't be held accountable for anything. Your child walks through the kitchen with a glass of lemonade, licking their lips as excited as can be. You knock it out of their hands and then you spank them for spilling the lemonade. Does that make sense? No, that tells me you got an anger problem. It tells me you got a control problem. It tells me that there is deep-seated insecurity in your life and you're taking it out on your kid. That is not God. That is important to understand. So, God issues a requirement for mankind. There is something that he puts out there that everyone is responsible unto. Number two, mankind fails in upholding God's requirement. Or if you just want to write in big letters, S-I-N. We sin. Whatever it is that God has called us to do, We are missing the mark. We are not matching up. We fall short of the glory of God. Number three, God has to judge our failure. Why is that? Because it's sin. Because he's righteous. Because he's just. Is he compassionate, gracious, loving? Yeah, he doesn't have to have a relationship with us at all, but he invites us into that relationship. But when we come into that relationship, and it's just by the simple fact of being created, I'm not even talking about believers and unbelievers here. The simple fact that we are God's creation and he is the creator puts us in an obligation to him because he is automatically our head. The atheist wants to say that there is no God. Everybody know, what is this organization we have here in in Madison? Freedom from religion? Man, we need to go, we need to get a bus and go visit those people. (laughs) Everybody see this situation down in Texas. The officer shot her neighbor. She says she was in the wrong apartment. She thought she was in her apartment, thought it was intruder, shot and killed. She's sentenced to 10 years for murder. The brother of the person that she shot asked for permission to hug her, which was amazing. And the media just destroyed it, which we don't expect any different. It's got to be political in some way. It can't be grace. It's got to be politicized. But not only that, the judge on the bench hugs her, uh uh-oh, 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 and gives her the truth. And the response of Madison was, we got to file a lawsuit. Now, here's what's great. Because the judge was black, they couldn't play the race card. I love that. Oh, oh, (laughs) pork barbecue, man. They couldn't play the race card in this situation. 
but we got to do something. Now, pause for a second. And, and forgive me for being on the soapbox about this, but let's just think through this as intelligent beings. Isn't the freedom from religious people, aren't they atheists? Why are they scared of a God that they don't believe exists? I'm not freaking out about Cinderella possibly coming to my front door. You see what I'm saying? Anybody got anxiety about the tooth fairy visiting them at some unknown night? We don't. We don't. Maybe some of you do. (laughs) But, but, there's no reason to be frightened of apparitions. If it's not true, why are you scared? And notice, by filing a lawsuit in this situation, what are you trying to say? Government is my God. That's scary. Scary place to be. So notice in this situation, let's go back. God judges man's failure. And here's what's interesting. God has no problem paddling his kids. He's a good dad, so he does that. But he doesn't paddle them and treat them like dirt afterwards. He deals with the sin problem. He deals with the violation. And then he embraces his children. He loves his creation. He does. He sent his son to die for him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. That's the demonstration of God's love. There are your four phases. Does everybody see on the chart how those four phases work out there? Yes? Everybody got that? Yes? Okay, good. Now, next one, Mitch. In every dispensation, man is tested as to his obedience and accountability to God. And here's the reason why God is trying to prove a point. In every dispensation, there's a requirement. Man is accountable for responding faithfully to what God has said. His word is true. In the end, dispensationalism shows that all of creation is dependent upon God in every facet of life due to our failures in the flesh. Or let me go ahead and ruin the ending of the story for you. At the end of every dispensation... What preaches through every opportunity in these seven dispensations is Jesus is your answer. Jesus is your hope. Jesus is your solution. Because what you find is whatever responsibility God gives us, we can't live up to. It is exceedingly exposing of our sin, and it is absolutely magnifying of the perfection of our Savior. That's the idea. Next one what are the dispensations if you want to go ahead and line them down your chart you can go ahead and fill them in for us as we go through the number one is innocence i won't elaborate on these we're going to go through each one of them and hopefully do a good job and i'm going to encourage you to ask questions as we go through if you have questions about them we're all the body of christ here we're all family we're all one part of another it's okay we can do that number one is innocence number two is conscience I love that number three is not federal government. It's civil government. Self-governance, I guess is what we would say. Number four is promise. Number five is law. Again, just down the left-hand side there, you can fill them all in. Or if you want to wait and fill them in as we go, that's fine too. Number six is church. Now, sometimes you hear the, the church age, the church dispensation described as the dispensation of grace. I don't necessarily subscribe to that, and let me tell you why. When I read from Genesis to Revelation, I find out that God has been gracious in all dispensations. There's a study, for instance, in our Sunday school class, we're going through the book of Deuteronomy, and it's about the law. It is, but what I find is incredible grace of Yahweh Elohim to his people Israel in the law. He is gracious in all facets. In fact, he cannot be not grace. Does that make sense? So since he's running the show, it's his house law, it's his administration that he is issuing to us. He is always gracious. We can't separate that from his character or how he works. He's always gracious. So I I, I like to call that instead the church age or the church dispensation. And the last one, and I will be emphatic about this, it's not just the kingdom. We have all this sloppy language and sloppy theology about the kingdom. The kingdom's in my heart. No, it's not. There's no way it would ever fit there. Stop it. If that's the case, you would be dead. Well, I'm here doing his kingdom work. No, you're not. It's a failure of realizing dispensations that has caused such sloppy theology of like that. Jesus doesn't need our help to build his kingdom. He can build it just fine without us. He does not need it. Our job is in number six, not number seven. 
So it is the millennial kingdom. Millennial meaning 1,000. The 1,000 year literal, political, theocratic rule of Jesus Christ from the throne of David in Jerusalem as he governs the entire world with righteous rule. And we're going to get to that. In fact, I might camp out on that. We'll forget doing the church. We'll just talk about the kingdom. I love the kingdom. So anyway, moving on. Next one. Next, next slide. This is important. This is going to get confusing for you. I'm going to ask you to pay attention only to what I have underlined. Just write that down and listen to me, right? Believe me now, listen to me later. Here we go. Everybody catch that? Believe me now, listen to me. Okay, whatever. A new period, a new dispensation always begins only when from the side of God, now pay attention to that because that helps you know when a dispensation changes. It's God's changing. God sets the course. We don't. Well, I think it's different here because I, no, 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 no. Take you out of it and look at what God's doing. From the side of God, a change is introduced in the composition of the principles valid up to that time. That is, when from the side of God, three, ta- three things occur. If you want to just write it down, a dispensation changes when these things occur. One of these three things, okay? And here's what you want to write down. Just the underlined part, and I'm going to give you an elaboration. In fact, in the original quote from this, from Eric Sauer's book, This elaboration in parenthesis is not there. That's me adding it in to help give you an an, an idea to grab onto some substance about what we're talking about. Number one, a continuance of certain ordinances valid until then. How do we understand that? Well, can you eat of the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil now? You can't. So therefore, it's not a stipulation for you to uphold. It is not a responsibility that you have in your stead. That's not for you and me. Therefore, if that's the case, it's no longer valid. Also, civil government continues through the promise to Abraham. Whatever God sets up a way for us to govern ourselves, just because a new dispensation starts doesn't mean that that self-governance stops. Does that make sense? It continues to go. In other words, capital punishment, as given during civil governance, and we'll look at that, is codified in the Mosaic Law. It's given a greater understanding and greater specifics lined out perfectly for people where you could go and actually look at it on the tablets or uh, when they wrote it, they probably wrote that part down on parchment. They only did the 10 words on that. So that's the idea. A continuance of certain ordinances are valid until then. That's when a dispensation would change. How about number two? An annulment of other regulations until then valid. The church, everybody hold on to it. Hopefully this won't get you all, all, all skewed this morning. The church is not obligated to keep the law of Moses. There are some people that believe, well, you're saved by grace, but if you want to be sanctified, you've got to live up to the law. And then they try to divide the law, the ceremonial law, then they'll go to the moral law. Well, the moral law, that's the part you need to do. The law never divides itself in Scripture. God never does that in Scripture. He always uses context to determine what he means by the law. So you and I as believers, we're not obligated to uphold the law. The law has one large function in the church age, and that's to tell us how sinful we are. It lets you know you are a sinner. It cannot save, but it can definitely accuse, and that's important for us to understand. So, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ completed the law for us. We do not have to uphold it. That's important to understand. Is it still God's word? Yes. Does it still tell us right from wrong? Yes. Here we go. Is the law bad? No, it's not. The failure in the law is our inability to keep it. The law is perfect, good, holy, righteous. It's the word of God. The flaw is right here. I'm the flaw. Number three. Amen. Thanks for amening that I'm the flaw. The Lord knows your heart. Let's stop and talk about self-righteousness. So I'm just kidding. Verse, or number three, verse three. Number three, a fresh introduction of new principles not before valid. In other words, there was something that God didn't have as valid beforehand, but when he introduced this brand new dispensation, He gave you a new understanding of something or he implemented something that was different. An example, capital punishment is allowed as a means of self-governance in Genesis 9. Whereas before this, it was prohibited. And the same goes with eating meat. Now, 
The first one we say, okay, I kind of get that. The last one causes revival in my heart. Because before that, everybody was a vegetarian. Can you imagine that existence? (laughs) Some of you are vegetarian by choice, and that's okay. But when Genesis 9 came along, smack my lips. You ever seen on those old cartoons, Tom and Jerry, Tom the cat, he knows he's going to be eating something. The knife and the fork, shink, 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 and he does that. Stuff it in the, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Praise God for barbecue. I love barbecue. So, notice before, <laughs> how many people got saved at church today? All the ones that love barbecue, that's who. <laughs> so, so notice, beforehand, it wasn't something that was permissible, but there was a time in history where God said, this is how you're to conduct yourself in this situation from this point forward. Great. God sets the boundaries. Next slide, please. First thing we're going to deal with is innocence. You already turned open to Genesis 1. Let's take a look at innocence. Let's deal with the start of it. What's the first passage we got here, Mitch? Genesis 2, forgive me, 2.17. We understand God created the world, heavens and the earth in the beginning. He lines out the six literal days of creation. He rests on the seventh day. Chapter 2, a lot of people have thought, well, this is a a different creation. This is a second creation that was made. It is not. This is an elaboration upon the first creation with the understanding of the responsibility that God has entrusted to humankind. And here's what's interesting. You don't find any other prohibition that goes on in Genesis 1 and 2 except for this one. And so because it stands out, As to what Adam is not to do, we can successfully understand that as God's requirement of the human race at that time. Look at verse, uh, let's see here, 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Now stop. Was Adam deprived at all? No. In fact, that's a pretty good ratio. Let's say they had 100 trees, 100 to 1. Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that ratio to feed myself. I think Adam can fill his belly on that many apples and pears and all other kinds of fun things, okay? Verse 17, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Does everybody see the no, no, no there? Okay, so what do you write down? Well, number one, you want to write down as far as your time period. I thought about bringing the Elmo up here, but it might be too confusing. The time period, the scripture references, you're going to look at the fact that Genesis 1 and 2 are the times of innocence. The requirement of God is do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, is that because the fruit was magic? No, it's because God's word is perfect. He said, don't do it. So if you violate that, you don't need a magic tree. You just displeased God. You just sinned against God's holy word. That's the problem. Now, remember, since we don't have this tree now, you can't commit this sin. So we all say, praise God, I can't do that. Because here's what we know from getting into Genesis 3. If that were the requirement before me, I would break it. I would reserve a Bahama cruise on the way. I would get on a large plane and I would fly over and I would find this tree and I would eat off of it because I am that sinful. I would make plans to sin against God. That is the evilness. Is that even a word? We'll say it is. Of my heart to violate that. Now, to the next one. Do not eat of the tree. Now you turn over to chapter 3. And let's be honest, from chapter 3 till about verse uh, 6, you're still part of the dispensation of innocence, okay? So let's read chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Here we go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, Yahweh Elohim. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has Elohim said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, just like Satan, to get her all mixed up, she starts adding to God's word. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it. Did he say that? No. No. So make sure that you mark that. 
God did not say this. Let this be a good lesson for us. Sometimes we often presume upon in conversation with other people what God has said and not said. Don't presume, know it. If you have to, carry the scriptures with you. We'll let you pass with the Bible on the phone thing this time. It's okay. We'll we'll give you a pass. But if you can have a copy of the scriptures with you, show them. Show them what God says. That's important. Don't put words in his mouth. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. That is dangerous. Because now you become presumptuous about the truth. We can't afford to do that in life. Now, notice what moves on here. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. And all God's people said, liar. Right? We're all dealing with it now. We're all looking forward to it in a very morbid way now. And if it wasn't for the new life in Christ, we would have no hope when we get there. Praise God, we can look beyond that event. So physical death is going to come into play at the moment that you violate God's command in this way. Verse 5, for God knows. Now notice how Satan tries to paint God. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now here's the interesting thing is, just like Satan, that's true. And God wants to keep you from that. God wants to keep you innocent and pure from a knowledge of good and evil. You don't need evil. But I can't stop doing this. That's a hard problem. But don't sit here and tell me you need it. None of us need sin. Well, how else is God going to cultivate me in appreciation? He's gracious enough in himself without having to need sin to better justify himself. To say that God needs sin to do that is saying that he's reliant upon sin. If our God is reliant upon sin, he's not much of a God because therefore he's not perfect without it. Does that make sense? So let's not smear his character when we think about these issues about the role that sin plays in our life in relation to how we are in fellowship with God. We don't need sin. That's important. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food... Which is weird because every tree is good for food. Where she's at, right? Innocence means perfection. She's in a state of perfection. There were no bad pears. She didn't come home and undo her grocery sack and get disappointed with the tomatoes she got from Aldi. Not that that happened recently, but (laughs) moving on. You know what I'm talking about, girl. See, my wife is stiff-jawed on that one. Yes. like, yep. Notice, and that it was a delight to the eyes. In other words, she started to covet it. Now, we don't have the law in play yet. See, that's another interesting thing about these dispensations. The law doesn't play a factor here yet. We can look at the law when it takes place, and we can look back on this situation and go, ah, there's more specifically what was going on there. But you can't insert it in this situation and say, well, she's coveting. She's already sinning. Not the case. It's not the requirement here. Notice what happens here. And that the tree was desirable. It was beneficial is what she thought to make one wise. She'll know more if she does it. Now remember this, she didn't need to know more. And I think this is important for us to think about as well. We don't need to know more. We only need to know well what God has told us. That's important. We're on this endless quest for knowledge and our Bibles remain dusty. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you, church. That is not true knowledge it's not so notice to make one wise she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her man in shining armor the chivalrous yet silent adam where was this guy you ever think that sometimes i stop and look in this text like if i could reach in there and wring his neck i would what was he doing he's probably at a badgers game i don't know but anyway What's that? He was distracted? He was distracted. I like all the ladies. He was distracted. Trust me. So so notice, she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. I didn't bring my fig leaves with me today. But what was mankind's failure? They ate of the tree. Fill it in the box. 
That's the problem. God said don't, they did. God said don't push that button, they had to. God said wet paint, do not touch. They said I got to get it on my hands. And what's amazing is, is when God calls them on them, even though they got paint on their hands and they're waving at him, they're sitting there telling him they didn't do it. You ever had a child like that? We're not any different. We like to think that we are. We like to think that we've grown up and learned, but with God, we have it. So we've got to be humble before him in those situations. How about the next one? Move forward. Verse 14. This is the pronouncement. Yahweh Elohim said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is what is known, I think it's Latin, as the Proto-Evangelium, or Eongelium is the idea. It's the idea of the first gospel. The fact that even though the serpent may seem to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, who we ultimately find out later on as Scripture unfolds itself as Jesus, So we take that for granted because we've grown up knowing it all the time. But what we find out is that the one whose heel is bruised actually delivers a crushing blow to the snake. Crushes his head. I don't know about you, but the simple fact that Jesus is willing to approach a snake like that has all my devotion in the world. Anybody else hate snakes? I do too. I do too. Joyce, I'm not talking about your husband, okay? That's good. (laughs) You got to get one in somewhere, right? You got to get one in somewhere. But now we got a problem. Because unbeknownst to us, maybe we were reading and we just missed it. We've now switched dispensations necessarily. Because God can no longer approach Adam and Eve as innocent human beings. They're now guilty. And they're not just guilty, but what came with eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil transpired just as God said it would. Now Adam and Eve know the difference between good and evil. You notice the first thing they did was looked at themselves, realized they had no clothes, and they rectified that problem. I can't help but to notice that all of you rectified that problem before you came here as well. (laughs) that one got an amen that's scary but here's the thing we look at the idea of public nudity and we say "Mm -mm, nope wrong can't do that shouldn't be there because we have a knowledge we have a conscience that testifies what is correct and what is incorrect what is right and what is wrong you've just walked into a brand new dispensation now god has to deal with his creation as sinners He has to deal with them as fully culpable for their guilt of not upholding his requirement. Let's move on here. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. That doesn't mean that you're going to make googly eyes at him and think that he's just wonderful. That's not what it means. It says here, and he will rule over you. It means that you will be trying to usurp the authority of the home and take the lead. That is not your role. It is actually, if you have those inclinations, it is a result of the fall. That's what it is. It's sin. It's important for us to understand. Now, God is not, this is the sin that you're now going to commit. He's saying, I'm smart enough and know all things. This is what you're going to have the propensity to do now that you have this sin nature in you about verse 17 then to adam he said because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which i commanded you saying you shall not eat from it cursed is the ground because of you in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust into dust you shall return. This right here is God's judgment. If you want to know what God's judgment is, it is verses 14 through 19. This is God's judgment upon the sin of violating his requirement. Don't eat of the tree. They eat of the tree. They are now judged because of their sin. Where's the grace in this? Look at verse 21. 
Yahweh Elohim made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I wish with all my heart that every heart in this room would be softened to what God has just done. Think about it. What does Adam deserve? Death. As soon as there were a, yeah, baby, whatever you want. (laughs) He should have fallen dead. Both of them. Right there in front of the serpent. They should have been dead on contact. See, this is, because here's the thing. You learn about God as the revelation progresses. What do you learn about sin right up front? You will surely die. Death. That's another conversation. I'll have it with you privately. (laughs) I was actually brought up in my class this week. Very interesting. Gave me a lot of food for thought. I got to study it out. Death. Anybody a fan of death? We've talked about this before. Don't you think it's interesting that when God created the world, not only did he not need sin, he didn't need death to accomplish anything. Which tells me that every time we have to engage death in our lives, deal with death, we have a close one, a loved one who dies, a family that goes through a sudden tragedy, it is an abnormality that's been introduced into the existence as God originally created it. See, this is what makes the kingdom so hopeful. And why I want to talk about it all the time, about what Jesus is going to do. Because at that time, he is going to liberate this world from death. Death has a hold on every single person. Is this not the reason why we preach the gospel? Isn't the gospel the fact that someone died for you? Why? So you wouldn't have to die. You say, but wait a second, I'm, 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 I'm going to physically die. Yes, you will. If you're a believer in Christ, you die once. What I love is that you live twice. Yeah. You live physically, and when you come to know Jesus Christ, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you live spiritually. He gives you eternal life. Pop quiz, how long is eternal life? Forever. Forever. Otherwise, somebody gave it the wrong name. And that person will be the Holy Spirit who inspired Scripture. I don't want to say that he's wrong. So it's forever life. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, guess what? You live once. And for you, this life is the best that it gets. Now that's a scary proposition. Because if this is all there is, where is there to go? That leads to the sad conclusion of two deaths. Not only is there a physical death of the body, there's a physical, or sorry, there's a spiritual death of the soul. The second death. That's actually what it's called in Revelation. The second death. As if dying once wasn't bad enough as a result of sin. That's sometimes what people do, don't they? Well, once I'm dead, I won't feel anything anymore. It's over. The pain's over. That's why some people make those types of choices. Well, the pain's over if I just do this. I'm here to tell you it's not. God tells us it's not. It's a temporary delay. It's a foolish solution to an otherwise greater problem because the problem is never about the physical. The physical never gets better. So our main concern needs to be about the spiritual. And the question we have to answer is, where do I stand with God? Now, here's what blows my mind about this scene. And and we got seven dispensations We're only going to get done with one today. But here's what blows my mind about this scene. Think about this for just a second. Adam and Eve only had one requirement. Ladies, you sometimes do that to your husbands, don't you? You only had one thing to do. What did you do? Because you know what they did wasn't that one thing. I think that's the reason why Eve committed this sin first is to kind of level that playing field a little bit. Because it's been the other way around forever since then, hasn't it? But think about it. One thing. There's one tree. Stay away from it. Just that one. Just that one. And notice there's something deep in us that says, I just can't do that, God. I just can't stay away from my sin. Or let me say it another way. 
it is impossible for me by myself to handle life before me. That's generally what we're talking about. Now, is life as busy then as it is now? No, I guarantee you this though, temptation hasn't changed. Temptation is still trying to convince you and me that we need something other than what God has for us. That's wrong. Here's the question that we ask at the end of innocence. Does innocence work to govern mankind? And I was going to put another box at the end of your chart so that you could write yes or no on there. It was going to squeeze everything up, not work. But here's the question I want you to think about. We're going to ask it at the end of every dispensation. Does innocence work to govern mankind? If we existed in innocence and had this requirement of God before us, would we come out okay? No. We would all sin. See, here's the interesting thing. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden. Could have been 20 years. Could have been two days. Could have been two seconds. We don't know how long they were there. The Bible doesn't give us a time period. But what we know is that when Satan started giving a neon sign that direction, they said, yep, 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 and they followed it. Does innocence work to govern mankind? It does not. No. Thank God for His grace. In fact, let me share this last passage with you. I think this is important. If you want to look at it, you can. I, I encourage you I encourage you to know this passage backwards and forwards because it's about the greatness of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Let's see it, Mitch, up on the screen, please. Should be the very last scripture in that uh, tally. But now, apart from the law, watch this. The righteousness of God. See, that's the problem. You and I have a righteousness problem. We have a righteousness problem. You say, wait a second, in innocence they don't have sin. Aren't they righteous? No, they're innocent. They're still creations. God is still the creator. And the only type of righteousness that is acceptable to him is a righteousness like his own. So in order for you and I to be acceptable in his presence, we've got to have his righteousness. There's one problem. We can't attain that. It is beyond our person to be able to grasp that and make it our own. Why? Because it belongs to him. It's his righteousness. But now, apart from the law, what does that mean? Apart from any works you could try to do. Apart from any do better, try harder, Go to AA, get your life in order, make things better, walk a straighter line, burn all your pornography. Doesn't matter what it is. You can set your house on fire thinking it will get you away from sin. You're just going to have trouble with the fire department. That's it. Apart from any works that we think might gain acceptance before God, God's got a better way. The righteousness of God has been made manifested. It's been made known. God has made his righteousness known. Well, how's he made it known? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, which is another way of saying we've got 39 books that often have dust on them in the front of our Bibles that constantly preach to us about the coming righteousness of God. Verse 22. Even, here it is again, the righteousness of God, don't mess up the channel, through faith. Not faith in works, not faith in good intentions, not faith in I promise to do better, not faith in I'll join your church, not faith in I'll get baptized, not faith in I'll walk an aisle, not faith in I'll pray a prayer, not faith in I promise I will be a better person. It is faith alone. And I actually believe, and this is insane, I actually believe that the word alone means by itself. I'm pretty sure that Merriam Webster agrees with me. Why? Because the word alone is not controversial or convoluted unless you've got an axe to grind. I think this is important. Especially with this area being so heavily saturated, Catholic and Lutheran, that's extra baggage that we often try to shed away. Side note, we're starting to think about options of where to put Nathaniel for pre-K. The K-4, whatever they call it, weird names. Think about, well, maybe St. John's be a good way do i have anything against my brothers and sisters of saint john's only one thing you do not have to be baptized to be saved because if that's the case that's about what you've done not about what christ has done and i am not a co-redeemer with jesus i cannot wait to have teacher conferences and conversation i'm excited 
I'm excited. <laughs> they don't know I'm coming yet, so listen, listen, listen. Shh. Don't tell them I'm coming. I want it to be a surprise. I want it. So even the righteousness of God, don't mix it up through faith in a person. Remember, truth just isn't a something. It's not a substance. Truth is a person. Truth is Jesus Christ. Faith. Let's not confuse faith. Faith is a conviction that something is true. That you have been fully persuaded that something is true. Here's the question that you need to ask to answer today. I don't care if you're interested in my sermon or not. I honestly don't. But you have to deal with Jesus. You have to deal with Jesus at some point in your life, whether you have or need to, or you know somebody that needs to. This is a good question to ask. What do you believe about Jesus? What are you convinced about Jesus? Are you convinced that he's the son of God who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave? Or was he just another good teacher? Was he just a prophet? Was he just another one, a special somebody? Well, I think he was a good moral teacher. He said he was God. And so if you don't understand him to be God, and yet you're saying he's a good moral teacher, you've got a conundrum. He said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. If he's a good moral teacher, he just told you the truth. Are you listening? Notice it's through faith in Jesus Christ for all who, what's the word, church? Believe. Believe. That's the issue. For there is no distinction for all have fallen short, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And here it is, being justified as a gift by his grace. What does that mean? I don't deserve forgiveness, and yet he's going to give it to me fully and freely. That's what it means. Justified, declared righteous in his sight. Or in other words, when God sees you, he sees you through Christ and you look perfect. Now, even for Tom, that's a miracle of God. I was actually giving you a compliment there. Notice, being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption, that's the price paid, which is in Christ Jesus, and that's him on the cross. Verse 24, I'm sorry, 25, whom God displayed publicly. Why did he display it publicly? Because he wants every single person to know. There's our responsibility. Do the people around you know that the righteousness of God has been manifested to the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? That they can be made right with him, declared righteous by him if they believe in Jesus Christ. Notice, publicly as a propitiation, that $5 word means a satisfaction. He satisfies the requirement. God's requirement for coming to him is satisfied in Jesus, not us. The satisfaction in his blood through faith, there's the channel. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Jesus demonstrates his righteousness, and it is shown to be the exact righteousness of God because he is God. Do you have that righteousness? Don't walk out of here today and not have it. That's silly. He's done all the work for you. It's free to you. Ed McMahon's not waiting on your doorstep for a requirement or obligation afterwards. It's free. It's free. It's free. That's what the word grace means. Gift. Free. Free. Nothing in life is free. I didn't say it was free overall. Jesus paid for it. He paid the price in full. Isn't it interesting when he died, paid in full? Boy, that's heavy language. Because he's speaking of worldwide liberation for those who believe in him. So busy trying to liberate the world, we stop preaching the gospel. We got something out of whack, man. So notice how this wraps up. Because in the forbearance of God, that word forbearance, all you parents know that word. That means patience. Patience. Long suffering. You're like, oh, you're preaching to me now. In the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. In other words, the reason why Adam didn't fall over dead as soon as his teeth hit that apple is because God was long-suffering and patient, impatient with us. Remember what we read from Psalm 103? He knows our frame. He considers that we're but dust. He does not repay us according to our sins. And we serve a gracious God. We serve a good God. Notice. The forbearance of God, he passed over. Oh, 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 that's okay. That's all right. He passed over the sins previously committed. Now let's switch. 
for the dem- for the demonstration of his what his righteousness man let that be a sweet word to you today his righteousness at the present time what's the reason so that he would be just in other words god's person is not infringed in any way because he is embracing sinners he still deals with sin the cross is an altar And the perfect Lamb of God was sacrificed upon it. Sin still has to be dealt with. Jesus is the one who dealt with it. So notice, God remains just because sin doesn't go unpunished. It goes fully punished. But look what it says after that. Not only is he just, not only does he keep his righteous character intact towards sin, but he is also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He's the one that who... I don't speak in tongues, I promise. He is the one who declares you righteous by faith. He's the only opinion that matters when it's all said and done. We're so worried about what bosses think, what family thinks. Here's a beautiful thing. Your sins have been paid for. If you're worried about sin in your life right now, the very first step to getting out from under that burden is to realize it's already paid in full. Accept what Jesus has already done for you. It is finished. We either believe God's word or we don't. We're either operating in belief or unbelief. That's as simple as that. But if you have believed, understand this, you have fully and freely, with no strings attached, the very righteousness of God. And you are as righteous as Jesus is in God's sight, not because there's anything righteous in you, but because of the righteousness that has been freely given to you by faith. We serve a good God. Man. Again, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. I pray that penetrates your heart. And I pray that throughout the day, as you're thinking whatever, going throughout, I, I don't care what it is. I pray that the, the idea that the righteousness of God is freely yours will come back to you over and over. I pray that the Spirit would provoke our hearts in that. In fact, let's pray now. God, I pray, please, that your Spirit would bring to constant remembrance in our hearts and minds that the righteousness of God has been freely secured by Christ our Lord and is freely offered to all who believe. Thank you, Jesus, for this amazing sacrifice. Took it upon yourself, bearing the sins of the world, And you have died for us. May our hearts be grateful. May our spirits be lifted. May we be drawn to genuine and unapologetic worship. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.